right, thank you. Delighted to be here in Berlin. As you said, it is a, um, a loose inquiry into understanding cosmic scale. I suppose one of the characteristics of the Anthropocene period is that this is the first time we have entities which can actually contemplate what they are themselves, what the nature is of the world around them, uh, what the scale of the cosmos might be in relation to their own scale. And important in early thinking in this is the nature of the macrocosm-microcosm relationship. The idea that the human body might be similar in a small way to what the universe is like in a large way. And I think the first people to pick this up were the early Hippocratics. These are the people who are related to Hippocrates. These are early Greek doctors who say, in a word, everything was arranged in the body by fire in a manner more suitable to itself in imitation of the whole, small to large and large to small. And this is typical Greek theorizing. There are four elements, earth, water, air, and fire. Fire is the dominant element which does um, the organizing when the cosmos is generated. And the idea here is that fire organizes the heavens in a similar way to, or to organizing the human body. So there is a center to the heavens and then various layers of the heavens going outwards from that. With the human body, we have a center of the stomach and various layers of the human body uh, moving outwards from there. So it's a way of trying to understand the nature of the human body in relation to the nature of the heavens. They did actually try to do some diagnosis coming out of this, some dream diagnosis, which said, if you dream about the stars, then that must mean, and you did dream about some imperfection in the stars, that must mean you must have some disease of the skin. Whereas if you did uh, dream about some disease, uh, sorry, some imperfection of the earth, that means you have some disease of the intestines. Um, interesting in that it sets out this notion of macrocosm, microcosm, and a relation between humans and the cosmos, which is comprehensible in human terms. If I just move on to Plato here, Plato typically tries something more intellectual with this. So this is Plato's model of the heavens. Um, in the center you have the earth, then sun, uh, sorry, moon, sun, five naked other planets, and then the stars revolving around that. Plato thinks that um, the stars revolve around in a day, and the moon, sun, and planets have different axes of rotation, and they move around in their own periods. Plato thinks that the motions of the heavens are the manifestations of the thinking of God. These are the way that you can see the thoughts of God. Plato thinks that we think in a similar way, but not as perfectly. Plato thinks that the planets and the stars all move with perfect regular circular motion, and that our thoughts are okay, but they're imperfect relative to the thoughts of God, and we must improve our thinking. So Plato thinks that our minds are a microcosm of the macrocosm of the heavens out there. If we ask Plato more specifically about scale, he will tell us something quite interesting. He will give us a list of um, relations of numbers, and he thinks these are perfect or ideal relations, and they're meant to be uh, relations of small integers. Um, all these numbers here are powers of three or two. And what Plato thinks he can get out of that is a translation of those ratios into musical notes. Why is that important? Because Plato thinks that that is how God has spaced the heavens. So the spacing for those orbits that we saw in the previous overhead is a musical spacing as in the stave. Now, I think that's a very interesting macrocosm-microcosm relationship because it means that humans have some sort of grasp on cosmic scale. There is some sort of human parameter to what's going on in the heavens, and we can have some sort of human grasp of the nature of the heavens, on the size of the heavens. If I move on to Aristotle, this is Aristotle's picture of the heavens, Aristotle thinking about 4th century um, BC. Again, we have the same sort of structure as we do with Plato. You have the Earth in the middle, then the Moon, um, Mercury, Venus, Sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and the fixed stars. One of the interesting things about this is that the Greek cosmos is actually quite small. So the distance from the fixed stars to Saturn is around the same order as the distance from Jupiter to Saturn. This isn't a modern picture of things where we have a huge depth of the star field and things are billions of light years away. 
Aristotle thinks that all the stars are equidistant. It's like a, a large sphere with the stars decorating the inside of it, and that is actually quite compact. It's no further beyond uh, Saturn than uh, Jupiter, uh, Saturn is beyond Jupiter. That gives a quite, again, a quite human scale to things. The other thing that's interesting about Aristotle is that he is uh, convinced that the motions of the heavens are regular and circular and repetitive. There's a cyclical nature to the, what's going on in the heavens. Aristotle likes to model things um, that happen down here on Earth on those lines as well and says that the weather cycle is like this. Water will go through a cycle of um, being water down here on Earth. It will then um, evaporate and become um, for, what for Aristotle would be air, condense in the heavens, cool off, and then fall down as rain again, and that will be a cycle. And that cycle is continuous and repetitive, just like the, the repetitiveness and cy um, cyclicalness of the heavens. I bring that in because that's actually quite interesting in relative to one of the great discoveries of science in the 17th century. And here I go to someone called William Harvey, who's interested in um, the circulation of the blood. It's Harvey who discovers that the blood circulates around the human body. And this is one of the things that Harvey has to say. This is the dedication um, of his great work. He says, most serene king, the animal's heart is the basis of its life, its chief member, the son of its microcosm. On the heart, all its activity depends. From the heart, all its liveliness and strength arise. Equally is the king the basis of his kingdom, the son of his microcosm, the heart of the state. From him, all power arises and all grace stems. And again, this is very interesting in the way it weaves together these macrocosm-microcosm analogies. Um, for as far as Harvey is concerned, the center of the cosmos is the sun, and outside that, everything radiates around it. Politically, he thinks the king effectively is the sun and everything radiates around that. Harvey also thinks that the heart is analogous to the sun and the human body is driven by the heart and the sun drives important processes in the human body. Why is that? Harvey is the first person to suggest that um, there is the circulation of the blood in the human body. Prior to that, people had thought there were two different sorts of blood in the human body, what we would call arterial blood and venous blood. And they thought that these, these two types of blood didn't mix, they had their different functions. Um, arterial blood was always in the arteries and venous blood was always in the veins. When Harvey wants to argue, actually, all these, blood, all these different types of blood are in one circuit and they um, uh, circulate rapidly, he then has to think about the question, how does one type of blood change into the other and vice versa? Now that's easy for us, we know about oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood, and we know that blood gets oxygenated in the lungs, deoxygenated in uh, the tissues and the organs. Harvey didn't know that though, and he didn't know any way of theorizing um, the process of um, a change from oxygenated blood to deoxygenated blood. So what Harvey does is say, okay, Perhaps the circulation of the blood, being a repetitive cycle and all the rest of it, is like the weather cycle and like the heavens. So Harvey thinks it's like the weather cycle in that uh, water changes its state from water into vapour, it then condenses, falls again and goes round in a cycle. And Harvey thinks that's what happens in the human body and again he thinks this is um, driven by the heart um, sim um, in a similar manner to way the sun drives the weather cycle. So, this is a depiction of the weather cycle and the circulation of the blood from one of Harvey's supporters later in the 17th century, a character called Saxo Lohenheim. If we look what happens in the weather cycle part of this, here we have, oops, ah, I have a technology failure. My laser pen has given up, we are saved. Here's the sun up here, and the sun is driving the weather cycle by evaporating water from the seas. The sea, this water then rises, forms as clouds, drops as rain over the land, forms little rivulets, springs, and all the rest of it springs up into little rivers uh, in a similar way as um, we get in the human body when uh, blood flows around. And that's what drives the macrocosm of the weather cycle. Oops. This is what happens in the human body. The heart drives the blood around, and there are changes. Uh, Harvey thinks that there's a change of um, type of blood in the heart, and he thinks it changes back in the extremities, and 
his heart drives um, the sort of weather cycle of the human body in an analogous way to the sun driving the weather cycle in the macrocosmic world. Very important for Harvard's thinking. Again, it gives a relation between humans and their environment, which is something that's conceivable to humans and is on um, a sort of human scale, if you like. It's interesting, this gets developed slightly later in the 17th century. It's a character called Nathaniel Highmore, uh, important an anatomist later on. Again, we get this same notion of um, a circulation of the blood and this analogy, this macrocosm, microcosm analogy to the weather cycle. What I like about this is there's a slight change here because ideas of mechanism become important in the 17th century. So here we have a 17th century stand pump for pumping up water. So the heart is now analogized to a pump. But what I love about this is this little Monty Python-esque hand coming out of a cloud. That is the hand of God operating the pump. Right? So your heart is being pumped by God, even, if it's no, even though it's a mechanical analogy. It's certainly a very human scale to what's going on here. Let me pick up on another theme here, which is the application of geometry both to the human body and to the heavens. So this is the Vitruvian man, a very important icon, both in the history of art and the history of science. Why so for science? Well, it showed that you can actually depict human beings very accurately and precisely by using the new geometrical methods of proportion and perspective that were developed in the Renaissance. That's critical because prior to the Renaissance, people hadn't really done very accurate drawings of the human body, and they hadn't really looked that hard because they'd looked um, to the ancients for authority on the nature of human anatomy and human physiology. Come the Renaissance, people start looking very hard again, and in the works of the great anatomists, anatomists of the 16th century, you suddenly find they're picking up all these stylistic stuff from the Renaissance, and they're applying it to the human body. They are finding new things in anatomy and physiology, and they are depicting it very accurately in geometric terms, in proper proportion and perspective. Um, so there's a, 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 an anatomist called Vesalius in the, in the 16th century. He decides this book is going to be properly illustrated, and the illustrations in it are absolutely beautiful, and it's believed they are done either by Titian or by the students of Titian. And it marks um, a moving forward in our understanding and depicting of the human body. So this is actually quite important, both in art and in science. Now, this sort of um, theme became important in astronomy and cosmology as well, in depicting the heavens. So the notion here is that you can fit a human being into a square, into a circle. One of the issues for cosmology, in ancient cosmology at least, is why are there five planets? Why are there this number of um, bodies in the, in the sky? And I say five planets because there are five planets which are visible to the naked eye. So for the ancients, the question is, why is there sun, moon, and these five naked eye planets plus the stars? Why that number? And why fit it together in quite this way? So a kept, uh, an astronomer in latter part of the 16th century, early part of the 17th century, called Johannes Kepler, decides to see if he can do a derivation of the orbits of the planets and why we have this number of planets. Now, Kepler was a sort of platonic idealist. He liked the idea of perfection. He liked the idea of geometry. And he said, right, OK, we have five perfect platonic solids. Why are they perfect? Because all their sides are the same. So with the cube, the cube is made of six identical squares. The tetrahedron is made of four identical triangles, octahedron out of eight identical triangles. And these were known as the platonic solids. And at this time, people recognized there's only a limited number of these. There are only five such solids. Kepler was intrigued by this and tried to do a geometrical application of this to the heavens. So what he does in outline is like this. So if you take a square, you can draw a circle inside of it and you can draw a circle outside of it. 
So what we're meant to imagine here is that this is a square making up um, one of the platonic solids, the cube, and that you can draw a circle inside and a circle outside. Now, of course, you can do this in three dimensions. You can do this with the cube, and you do it with spheres, but it's just easier to depict in uh, two dimensions. And that will give you a ratio of little r and big R. And you can do that for um, other two-dimensional entities, such as the triangle as well. And again, Kepler would be doing this in three dimensions. It's just easier to depict in two dimensions. And you can build up a theoretical picture where you use the five platonic solids to give you spacings between the circles and the ratios r and little r. And the idea is that these circles are going to represent the orbits of the planets, and these ratios are going to give you the ratios between the orbits of the planets. And in one of the most marvelous results in the whole of the history of science, this works. Right? This gives you, within the observational limits of the early 17th century, the known ratios of the planets. Isn't that a brilliant result? So what people did was make very large depictions of Kepler's cosmos. So there you have one orbit there. There you have the cube inside it. Inside that is the next orbit. Inside that orbit is the tetrahedron. Inside that, we're getting on towards the sun. They did this in quite beautiful and detailed workings. There you have one orbit. That will be a dodecahedron. Getting inside there, I think it's a bit too complex to tell. But that gives you the ratios of the orbits of the heavens. It also gives you a, re a reason why there are only that number of planets. Why? Because there are only that number of platonic solids. You can't have any more planets because there aren't any more platonic solids. And as I say, it's a brilliant result. It's, it's brilliant for the time, and it's very explanatory. What's more, it gives you a scale to the cosmos, and it gives you a scale which is comprehensible to humans. And I think that's very, a very important part of what Kepler is doing. There's another part to what Kepler does, which is equally important in many ways. Um, Kepler said planetary orbits are elliptical. Now, planetary orbits actually aren't anything like that elliptical. They're, they're much more circular than that, but this is just there for demonstration. And with an ellipse, you can pick out the major axis and the minor axis, and you can play some mathematical games with this. You can work out what the planet's speed is at that point, that point, that point, and that point, and derive ratios between them. You work out mathematically um, ratios rel related to how eccentric um, the ellipse is, how um, extended it is. So Kepler does that, and from those ratios, again, you can develop some musical notes. And here we have the harmony of the heavens, according to Kepler. Right, so he's worked out those ratios from the elliptical orbits of each of the planets, and that is what you get out of it. Um, it's quite interesting in some ways. Venus plays a very dull tune. In fact, it's monotonous, because Venus's orbit is the most nearly spherical. It is the least elliptical of the planetary orbits and most spherical, so it plays a dull tune. Mercury has the most... Um, elliptical orbit of the planets, and therefore it plays a very interesting tune. Again, I think this is a marvellous result. Um, what Kepler is trying to do, effectively, is to say, OK, there is a human comprehension for this fact, uh, all these facts about the orbits of planets. Let me now try a different thread for this talk. Bang! That was the biggest bang I could find. Right? It's in 96 point, right? and it is meant to represent the Big Bang which started the universe. Now, of course, that raises a question as to whether 96 point is big enough to represent the Big Bang, to which my answer is, I haven't a clue. And that raises a huge question about how on earth do you depict the Big Bang? Is it good enough just to put bang on, a, on an overhead like that? If so, how big? The Big Bang is beyond our human comprehension, I take it. I, I find it something very difficult to comprehend on all sorts of levels. 
Now, I'm starting on a theme here which says something about modern cosmology and how it's different from the people I've talked of beforehand. So you get the Big Bang goes off. Then you get this famous um, COBE map, the Cosmic Background Explorer map. What this tells us is at a relatively early stage of our universe, you get this differentiation of energy levels. So the red, the red bits are um, denser uh, patches of energy, the green bits and blue bits are light, uh, less dense patches of energy. And it's thought that these act as gravitational attractors and effectively they're the seeds for planets, galaxies and stars and all the rest of it. This happens 300,000 years after Big Bang. 300,000 years, that's beyond my comprehension. Even more beyond my comprehension is it's 14 billion years since that was the state of the universe. But out of this, we can argue that you get such things as solar system formation. So out of those patches, those denser patches of energy, they act as gravitational attractors. You get more in, uh, matter and energy attracted into them. Um, that will start to spin. It will spin more and more. Little bits will come off of it, will attract more matter. And ultimately, you get the formation of the solar system. That is a brief history of time in about two minutes. Not as erudite as Stephen Hawking, but quicker and cheaper than reading the book. <laughs> I mean, I do want to say something serious out of this, which is that if you ask a modern physicist or astronomer, why are there eight planets in the solar system now that Pluto's been kicked out? They will say, what sort of question's that? Yeah. Um, if you press them a little more, they'll say, OK, look, um, it's going to depend. What's it going to depend on? It's going to depend on how much matter gets assembled in the first place, how quickly this thing spins, how much matter gradually accretes to it, and how it all comes out. It's really an accident. There's no real reason why there are eight planets in the solar system. There's no real reason why they have those specific orbits. That's just an accident of how much matter came together and how fast it was spinning. And I suppose the contrast here is in modern cosmology, we take it there are a great number of accidental things about the cosmos. Things that don't really have um, a specific explanation. We can give them a general explanation in terms of the physics that's going on. But to ask how many planets are, orbit are orbiting the sun really isn't a question of interest for modern theoretical physics. The great contrast then is that for particularly for Kepler and for Plato and for all these people I've been talking about, they believed that the cosmos had been put together by some benevolent deity. And that for every disposition, every placement that cosmic deity made, there was a reason for them to do that. So that's why Kepler is interested in trying to show there are this many planets because God could only have used this many perfect solids. God has put the planets in precisely those orbits in order to instantiate the cosmic music. So I think there's an important breaking point between that more ancient cosmology, which is based on the idea that for everything in the cosmos, there must be a reason why it is so, and reason why it is good, and reason why it has to be. And modern cosmology, where we're happy to accept some sort of accidents. The other big contrast I would want to put in here is the question of comprehensibility to human beings. I think in the earlier cosmology, people were looking for answers which would give the universe comprehensibility to humans. That is, the scale of the cosmos is something that we can understand. We understand the cosmos in terms of some sort of analogy to what's going on in our own bodies, to the weather cycle and the rest of it, and that generates a scale which is comprehensible to humans. I think that has been given up by modern cosmology, whether rightly or not, and the scale of the universe, whether we are talking um, in terms of its um, scale in space or its scale in time, are now, I think, incomprehensible, and we don't try to model them on any sort of human analogue in the way that we used to. I think the work of Kepler and... Uh, Plato is marvellous for its time, 
and they both pursue things that were open to them at the time. I think the shift comes when you start having telescopes look, look far enough um, into the heavens to realise just how big and how awesome it is. I'll just show this overhead, because it's one of my favourite images from the history of art. Working out how to dispose things in the cosmos is not easy. So here we have the one and only depiction I know of a depressed angel. Why? Because they've got to generate the heavens, and around the angel are all the um, paraphernalia of, of geometry and mathematics. So there's a compass in our hand, um, up here are scales, that's a clock measuring time, that's a little number pattern, wondering how numbers fit into it. Down here you have a perfect uh, one, a, a solid in terms of sphere, there you have a rather more irregular solid. How do you put all these things together? And this is, this is a woodcut from a guy called Dura, who I think is wondering about two things. How do you put all these things together in a cosmos, and how do you put all these things together in terms of perspective, geometry, and the rest of it within art? I'll mention one more um, theme within um, macrocosm and microcosm, because I've talked about people who have tried to depict the world quite precisely in terms of macrocosm and microcosm analogies. Um, William Harvey was actually preceded by a character called Giordano Bruno, who, about 50 years before Harvey, speculated on the idea of the circulation of the blood, on the idea that the heavens saw the circulation of God's soul, um, our soul resides in the blood, so shouldn't our blood circulate as well? Um, no one picked up on that particularly because it seemed a rather improbable idea. What Harvey did was actually to demonstrate in experimental terms that you get the circulation of the blood. So Harvey is a much more precise um, interpretation of macrocosm mic microcosm. Ha uh, Bruno is much more speculative and is much more interested in the allegories of man's relation to the cosmos. Um, around the time of Kepler, you also get a character called Robert Flood, who, is, who has um, a bitter dispute with Kepler. He says the macrocosm-microcosm analogy shouldn't be used in this way to, to, gen to generate precise proportions of the cosmos. That's quite wrong. Um, all, we do, all we should use it for is to understand man's spiritual relationship to the cosmos and man's place in the spiritual world. So again, this is um, Flood. Um, he thinks this is, this is Flood's divine monochord. It's meant to depict the cosmos and the way the cosmos is tuned by God. This theme of God's hand coming out of clouds is quite common in some Renaissance stuff. You can also go to depictions like this, where you have the sense of um, God outside and overriding the cosmos, chained to human beings, chained to the lower animals, chained to the earth. This is a macrocosm, microcosm analogy, which is trying to give you some sense of um, human beings' um, spiritual relationship, both to the things around them and to the cosmos. So that microcosm, macrocosm um, analogy is used in several ways. Um, I suppose what I want to say out of this is something like this. Um, if we're going to have an Anthropocene era, which seems to be quite reasonable that we do, then there will be strata within that era. And I think one of the interesting intellectual strata um, is the way in which we've conceived of human beings in relation to the cosmos. I take it one stratum is when we looked at human beings and thought perhaps we can construct some conception of the scale of the cosmos um, on human scale and on the human being's relation to the cosmos. I take an important change of strata is to move from that stratum to the modern stratum where we no longer conceive, conceive of, um, human, of human scale and human experience as good enough to depict um, the nature of the cosmos. I will close on one thought about cosmology and the Big Bang, which is this. Modern science has solved the issue of which sort of answer we give to problems. So there's an old problem that goes back to Plato, which is the learner's problem, which says, if you know, why do you need to learn? If you don't know, how will you look for something? Because you won't know what to look for, and you won't know what you've got when you found it. I think modern science has solved that problem in 
relation to most of its disciplines. I think it's notable that modern science hasn't solved that in relation to cosmogony in terms of Big Bang. Why? Um, because we give our explanations in terms of space and time and causality. The problem with the notion of the Big Bang nowadays is that we think that it's not the case that the Big Bang went off um, in a container where there was space and time, but space and time are generated with the Big Bang. So there is no space and time before the Big Bang goes off. That's, that does away with any orthodox explanation of the Big Bang. You cannot have a simple causal explanation of the Big Bang. That then leaves us wondering what sort of explanation would be appropriate for the Big Bang. And if you look at modern cosmogony, there are debates about whether we use an anthropic principle, whether we should invoke some sort of design principle, intelligent design or God or whatever, whether we should invoke a whole multitude of universes, all of which are slightly different. And the reason why the, the debate is so fraught is that no one knows what sort of answer we're looking for there. And I think that's an interesting issue for the Anthropocene era, and it's an interesting issue, I think, in relation to what I've said, because we no longer have that anthropocentric view that the cosmos is on a scale that's comprehensible to human beings, or even that the explanation is going to be comprehensible in terms of the explanations we've previously had. So we really are um, swimming around trying to discover what sort of explanation we would like for Big Bang. But as I say, I think those are all interesting issues for the Anthropocene era. I think you can d divide the Anthropocene era into strata on this question of cosmology. And I think the issue of the scale of the cosmos is an interesting one to look at, both in past terms to try to depict it as in some sort of human understandable scale, and in modern terms where we've lost that and we have to move on to something new. And I think that's all I've got to say for today. So thank you for your attention.